AM 590, The Answer. I'm Dan Gilchrist, and you're in tune for another AM 590 Spotlight on Business. Today, we're shining the spotlight on a very important part of the Inland Empire. It's the Livestream Blood Bank. And I am honored and pleased to announce our special guest today is Dr. Rick Axelrod, Livestream Blood Bank President, CEO, and Medical t- Director. Rick, thank you for coming in and welcome to our, our show. Well, thank you for having me. Now, uh, Dr. Axelrod, uh, let's talk a little bit about Livestream Blood Bank, some history, background, and bringing us to the present. How many hospitals does Livestream serve today? Okay, so we serve 80 hospitals in Southern California. We distribute about 150,000 pints of blood to those hospitals. So we started back in 1951 as the Blood Bank of San Bernardino at Riverside County only serving the uh, counties of San Bernardino and Riverside and have expanded through the years to serve all six counties in Southern California. I did not realize that. I I thought thought it was just Inland Empire. So how did the transition to uh, Livestream Blood Bank come about? It was Riverside, San San Bernardino County. I guess since it's going to more counties, you had to focus differently. Yeah, we just, uh, once we expanded beyond San Bernardino, Riverside County, and I will mention that San Bernardino, Riverside County are still our primary business. We have smaller amount of business in those, those other counties. We decided that it would be important to have a name that wasn't so geographically isolated since we were serving a few hospitals in LA County, Orange County, Imperial County, and even San Diego County. So Livestream Blood Bank became our name in 2008, and that's been our name ever since. So uh, when people uh, give blood, who is on the receiving end of those donations? So particularly people who are undergoing surgery, people who are uh, undergoing treatment for cancer. That's a big portion of the population Mm -hmm. who are treated with chemotherapy. It knocks out their ability to produce their own red cells. So they need um, uh, help during this time that their bone marrow is suppressed. And until they get better, uh, um, uh, accident victims uh, need blood. Babies need blood. A lot of babies that are born prematurely, they need blood products as well. So there's a big group of people. And the number, the pints of blood that I was talking about that we need, that doesn't even account emergencies. So 500 donations a day are needed in the Inland Empire in order to meet the needs of just the everyday needs of the hospital. That's an incredible demand. It is. And it's a real challenge for us. And that's why we're in the middle of a blood shortage right now. We came off December, which was holiday time when people aren't thinking about donating blood. There are lots of other things for them to do. And then we have a little bit of a flu season going on. And so people aren't coming out. So come January, the supplies we had on the shelf are being exhausted. And now we have less than a one day supply of almost all the blood types in the blood bank. Uh, That's kind of scary to hear about that. If there's some kind of we don't want anything major to happen, but some kind of a major emergency, we're in trouble. Yeah, we are. And even for routine stuff. I mean, when we get this low, uh, surgeries potentially have to be canceled. Somebody who's waiting for a transfusion because they were treated with chemotherapy, they might have to wait an extra day to get that unit of blood. Nobody wants that to happen. None of us want that to happen. So really, when I'm asking the listeners here, is really a community ownership of the blood supply, making sure that we as a community do donate that 500 pints a day to make sure that we don't ever have to worry about a blood shortage in our area. It it sounds serious. Uh, What steps might hospitals have to make if if, uh, we run out of blood? Yeah, they they have to really ration what's there. So they might have to uh, delay surgeries that are less important. Uh, they may have to wait an extra day or two to transfuse a unit of blood to either the baby or or somebody oh, being treated goodness. for cancer. I mean, this is really serious stuff. And everybody thinks somebody else is going to do it. And and we know that when we have a crisis, right, uh, like when we had the San Bernardino shooting, uh, which was unfortunate, we had 800 people lined out our blood center waiting to donate. They didn't care how long they had to wait. They were waiting to donate. But what people have to remember is those units of blood were not the units of blood that were being transfused to the victims that were shot. It was the people that had donated the week before. Mm. And that's really critical. So so what we need to, to really impress upon the listeners is that 500 times a day, there's a San Bernardino-like shooting crisis 
for those people being transfused to those family members that are family members of the cancer patient or family members of the man with heart surgery or family members of the woman who's undergoing a mastectomy, removal of the breast because of breast cancer. That's their kind of 9-11 moment, right? And they don't want to be worried about whether there's blood available because they're, they're already, already dealing with a family crisis of illness in their family. So 500 times a day, we have to take ownership of that and understand, please make that appointment for to come in or just walk in and donate. Uh, you know, we can take you as a walk in as well, but really think about donating two to three times a year. And that'll make sure that we don't have any uh, shortage ever. You're listening to AM 590, The Answer, our spotlight on the uh, live stream blood bank and talking with uh, Dr. Rick Axelrod. Uh, Dr. Axelrod, it, it's a, really an honor to have you in here. I'm, I'm curious, you are a medical doctor. That's correct. How did uh, you get into the blood bank? Well, actually, during my training is when the AIDS crisis hit in the blood supply. And that's when we learned that we could transmit AIDS through um, blood transfusion. Prior to that um, uh, event, uh, we had very rare uh, transmission of disease through the blood supply. We had hepatitis, and that was the one thing we knew about, mm -hmm. but really not much of anything else. And then when HIV hit, that became a real crisis for us. It opened up the whole field of what we call transfusion medicine, and I decided that I wanted to devote my career to working with uh, this field, reducing the uh, potential for spreading disease through blood transfusion, and making sure that patients were being transfused the safest blood that they could uh, in our community. And we're, we're glad you did that. I mean, yeah. this is an incredible field if you think about it. Now, I was thinking, you're, you mentioned before about the, the people going through surgery. Uh, my wife recently had to have surgery, and of course, they are prepared. They say you may need blood. Uh, she didn't, thank God. But the, added, the, the stress we had just going into that surgery, if they had, had thrown more curveballs at us saying, no, we don't have blood, we can't do this surgery now, that has to be terrible. Yes, it is. And nobody likes to be part of that. And, and, and that's why I'm saying this is really a civic responsibility. It's really the community responsibility to come in and ensure that our fellow neighbors are uh, 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 able to receive blood without ever worrying or concern. And really about paying it forward, right? Because any of us can could need blood in the future. And actually, there are statistics that show by the time we reach 80, 80 years old or more, more than half of us are going to have a blood transfusion. So this way to pay it forward is really, really important. And I'd like to impress upon people, we don't have too many opportunities in our lives where we can do something and save somebody else's life or help save somebody else's life. And the simple act of kindness of going in and donating a unit of blood, which takes between 45 minutes an hour from start to finish is a small thing to do to potentially save a community member's life. So quickly, how do I respond? How do I give blood? What do I need to, first step I need to do to get into the blood bank and, and donate? Sure. So the, the best thing to do is, if you can, is make an appointment. That's the, that's the best thing. But we take walk-ins as, as well. But go to our website, which is lstream.org, all, all lowercase, L-S-T-R-E-A-M.org, and go in and it'll say, do you want to donate? You put in your zip code and it'll tell you which donor center is near you or what mobile or blood drive is going on in your community and what day and time that's going on that you can go over to. So you can do it either by going to a blood drive in the community or going to one of our donor centers that are located in your community. We have donor centers in San Bernardino, Riverside, Ontario, Marietta, Victorville, Rancher Mirage, La Quinta, and we just opened a new one in the Moreno Valley Mall. And I've seen your, your buses on the road. Actually, when you're commuting on the road, you pass these beautiful uh, buses that yeah. say live stream on. Yes, we have about 10 buses that go, Ten. Into, the, yeah, that go into the community, all the different parts of the community. Uh, uh, just for background, remember that San Bernardino is the largest county by territory by geography in the entire United States. And Riverside is, I think, number four. And the two counties themselves of 4.5 million people is larger than 24 states. Wow. So we cover a lot of territory. And we have th that many people that we should be able to collect enough blood to make sure that you know, we can meet the needs of, of people in the community. Yeah, the size of the area that you have to cover, just that must be a challenge in itself. It is, it is. We cover a large territory. So, um, you know, so it really helps if we can have donors support our blood drives because we are traveling large distances and if they can come into our donor centers to donate. 
You're listening to our AM590 Spotlight on Business, and we're focusing on Livestream Blood Bank, to- talking with uh, Dr. Rick Axelrod from the, the uh, Livestream Blood Bank. He's the president, CEO, and medical director, man of many hats, and we're, we're happy you're here. Uh, you know, I am a type 1 diabetic. It, that kind of stuff, is that somebody that can give blood? Yes, and actually, I'm so glad you brought that point up because the the biggest challenge we have is people self-defer themselves because they don't think they can donate blood because they might have a disease. So first, anybody with diabetes, as long as you're well-controlled, is absolutely allowed to donate. If you have a history of cancer, if that cancer has been treated and you're uh, free of disease even one year after treatment, you're able to come in and donate. If you have high blood pressure, well-controlled with medication, and your blood pressure is normally between is is uh, between 180 over 100, lower than 180 over 100, you're more than welcome to come and donate. So there are a lot of things that people think they can't donate, and absolutely they're able to come and donate. So we don't want you to self-defer. And the other benefit is you say, okay, I might wind up being deferred. We do a mini physical for you when you come in and donate. So we take your temperature, we take your blood pressure, we take your pulse, and we check your iron. So worst case scenario is you get a free mini physical coming in to donate. And actually, we have found people that have had health situations that came in to donate that do nothing about that we have referred over to their physicians and then found out that they had something wrong and it was found through the donation history process. And so we actually have a couple of campaigns where we have promoted donating blood saved my uh, donating blood saved my life. You know, I didn't save somebody else's life. I saved my life because I learned I had a disease that I didn't know about by coming in and donating blood and trying to help somebody else. Well, that, that's like you say, pay it forward. That That's another way to, you're paying it forward, but you're you're reaping an extreme benefit from that. Yeah. So, you know, we encourage everybody to come in and try to donate, and then we'll let you know whether you're able to do that. And like I said, you get a free mini physical as a result of that, and that's a, a really nice thing to have. Speaking of uh, of requirements, uh, the basic requirements to donate, are, is there an age, weight, those kind of requirements? Sure. So so there is a minimum age, uh, uh, 15 years old. You 15. can actually donate 15. But if you're 15 or 16 years old, you need parental consent. But okay. 17 doesn't? 17 and that's older does not require. There is no upper age limit. That's another thing that people self-defer. Oh, I'm 75 years old. I can't donate. Not at all. We have donors that are 90 years old that are donating blood. It is absolutely fine as long as you're healthy and and you're passing the physical and able to do everything, you are able to donate. No, uh, there is a lower weight limit, which is 110 pounds. You can't be less than 110 pounds. Uh, to donate, but there's no upper weight limit with regards to that. So, uh, uh, but you know, our biggest challenge is just making sure that you're over 110 pounds. So basically, as long as you're healthy and within a weight range and over 15, you you can help with this uh, blood shortage we have. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we distribute 150,000 units of blood. There are 4.5 million people in the Inland Empire. If just 4% of the population donated, that would be 180,000 pints of blood. And right now we're only collecting about 130,000 pints of blood. We actually import 20,000 pints of blood from other area because our region is not meeting its own need. And that's really critical. So we are collecting a a little less than 3% of the population in the Inland Empire. And if we just get it up to 4%, just having people make the pledge, we're in January, kind of New Year's resolution, donate one more time than you did the year before. If you donated once, Donate twice this year. Donate twice. Donate three times. If you haven't donated at all, go in and donate for the first time in 2020. Now, I, ma- I imagine have- people are, are have a, a fear of, of that donation process. You can maybe you can alleviate some of the fears. Sure. So the only thing, every, everything is 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 very easy and calm, except people are afraid of getting a needle in the arm. You right. know, and what I can tell people is is, is like a pinch. You know, a little stick and then you don't feel anything after that, okay? And the other thing I ask them to concentrate on is think about your worry of a needle stick versus the patient that's undergoing chemotherapy, where they get nauseous, where they lose their hair, where they lose weight. They, you know, it's really, really tough on them. And so if you think of it in the perspective of the life you're saving and what they're going through, going through the donation process and getting this little needle stick is really a small price to pay for helping save somebody else's life. 
And if you're talking about 1% of our population or 1% more of a, the people that are giving blood now, you're saving a life. I mean, how, how rewarding that can be. Yeah. And, and that's really what it's about. Like I said, you, you, you ha we don't have a lot of uh, things in our life where this, like in one act, can actually have an effect on somebody else. And donating blood has an effect on some someone else. And as we talked earlier, uh, one of the things maybe to encourage people to come in is we actually, after you donate blood, we text you or email you, depending on how you wanna be communicated, how your where your blood went to. We can tell you the hospital it went to. We can't tell you who it went to uh, for patient privacy like, concerns, right but we tell you where the blood, like your blood went to Loma Linda University, your blood went to uh, Redlands Community Hospital, your blood went to St. Bernardine's, and our donors have told us that oftentimes when they receive that message, that reminds them to make their next appointment to go donate blood because they're so glad to hear that where their blood was used. So maybe as a little incentive to those of you who've never donated before, this is really kind of exciting as a program we started in 2019. Sounds like there's not many reasons not to donate. That's what I like to believe, but uh, <laughs> we're trying to com uh, communicate to the people that are listening today how important it is to donate and don't think that everybody else is doing it and to really take part in this uh, life-saving process and, and really helping your fellow neighbor. So I want to uh, re have you repeat again, uh, how much time does it take to, to donate blood and, and, and how do I make that appointment again to uh, to begin this process? Sure. So the whole process takes 45 minutes to an hour at the most from start to finish. The actual blood donation process, like the needle in the arm filling the blood bag, takes six to eight minutes. All right. But the rest of the process is the donor history, doing the mini physical, and then after you finish donating blood, we feed you well in the canteen, give you all these goodies <laughs> and snacks. You have to stay for 10 minutes just to make sure you're okay, and then you can go off. Um, Again, how do you do this? Go into lstream.org, uh, L-S-T-R-E-A-M.org, and say and find the little icon that says, I want to donate blood, and it'll prompt you to put in your zip code or and, and tell you where the possibilities are for you to donate, and then you can uh, make an appointment. The other thing that's new is that you actually, on the day of donation, you can only do this on the day of donation, if you want to speed up the donation process, is you can fill out all the materials online and then come in and you, what happens is when you fill it out online, when you finish, you'll have a barcode and then on your phone and then you bring in the, your phone and picture ID, remind everybody you have to have picture ID, like a driver's license right. and, um, and we want that barcode and it self-populates the entire history form and so it saves you a whole bunch of uh, time when you come in. So it could be f 15 minutes less if you pre-fill out that form, but it must be on the day of donation by FDA law. That's a, that's a, it has to be on the day of donation. Yes. So that's it, important. To that's know. very important. That's a rule for the FDA. It's not our rule. Right. Well, that sounds like something I would appreciate doing. That I like to save time, and so go to the live stream, uh, which is lstream.com. Dot org. Dot org. .org. .org. We're, a non, org. we're a nonprofit, so it's dot org. So everybody, okay. also, if you're listening, we are a nonprofit organization. Every all the money. Uh, that that is gotten into the organization is reinvested in the organization. Very very important to people uh, to know that we're a nonprofit. And you're listening to our AM five ninety Spotlight on uh, the, the live stream blood bank and uh, our special guest, Dr. Rick Axelrod, the live stream blood bank president, CEO, and medical director. I'm curious when I come in and donate, how much actual blood do I donate? Well, you're donating one pint, so one pint. the average person may have between ten and twelve pints of blood. In, the, in their system, and so you're donating maybe five to 10% of your body volume. And how, how long does it take for my body to reproduce that one pint of blood? It probably takes uh, two weeks to, to a month uh, to replace. It, it's not the, the volume of the blood. The volume of the blood gets replaced immediately within 24 hours. It's actually the hemoglobin that's in the blood. Mm. That takes a little bit more because that comes from the bone marrow. And so you're giving up one gram of hemoglobin when you donate, and it takes about two to four weeks to get that gram of hemoglobin back. So uh, again, back to my type one diabetes. <laughs> So I, I, they always check my hemoglobin A1C when I go and get a lab test done. Would that affect my, my A1C results? 
Uh, absolutely not. It has uh, nothing it to do with it. has nothing to do with it. Uh, uh, the one thing also, as we're talking about this, is what the most important thing for a blood donation to make sure that you won't have, feel weak or, or any sort of reaction to donating blood, make sure you come in hydrated. Make sure you drink lots of fluid. About that. Not about, it's not about food. You don't necessarily have to eat. Uh, we like you to eat, but the biggest important thing is hydrated. Drink lots of water, fluids to make sure that you're hydrated when you come to donate blood. And that helps probably with the after donating blood too. Yeah, it, 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 it helps in two ways. One, it makes your veins nice and big uh, because you have lots of fluids in there, so easy. So for those of you worried about a needle stick, it makes that needle stick much easier. And then it helps with after the process as well to make sure that you're you know still fully hydrated even though we took a pint of blood from you. So I'm thinking about this in the scientific world we live today. We can't manufacture human blood, can we? That's correct. And all and all the magnificence of science and all the improvements that we've had in the world, blood still cannot be created from the laboratory. It has to come from volunteer donors. And so it's really critical. I mean, this is the one thing where human, the human being is so important to the process to making sure that you know, we can do the work we do. Remember, we are the fuel, the blood is the fuel that allows the hospitals to do their work. They can't do their work if the fuel isn't given to them. And that's what's really critical. I mean, we are such an important part. The community is such an important part of this process to allow the hospitals to do their job for saving lives. And if we don't have that fuel available, we have a fuel shortage, right? You need fuel in your car in order for you to do things that, and you need to fill it up routinely to make sure we need the blood bank tank to be filled regularly 500 times a day so that we can continue to provide that fuel to the hospitals so they can help save lives. And right now, you're not able to get 500 a day. You're, you're, that's why you're here asking for more. Correct. That's why we have less than a one-day supply of almost all the blood types, and we really need people to be coming into the donor center or participating in our blood drives to make sure that we get to that 500 pints a day. So they have it. Get off the couch. And uh, first step is to go to livestream.org. And that's a great place to start because it can steer you to the localist, make you, help you make an appointment for the, the blood bank and uh, show, tell you where the closest one to where you're at is too, to make it convenient for you. That's correct. And let me just correct lstream.org, not livestream. Oh, I'm org. sorry. That's all right. <laughs> lstream.org and then put in your zip code and it'll tell you the nearest donor center or the nearest blood drive that's going on for you to donate. And you can make an appointment. Okay. lstream.org is the correct website and uh, are the yes the website and that'll give you all the information you need once again we're talking with dr rick axelrod livestream blood bank president and ceo and medical director encouraging you to, to go and donate blood as soon as you can we, we need the help right now yeah and also we're on social media so facebook twitter uh, all these different uh, uh media uh, uh, opportunities. You can go look uh, us up there and you'll see pictures posted of patients whose life were saved, who uh, donors who um, have, have posted things about saving lives and learn a little bit more about our organization as well. It's just a fascinating uh, field. If you, if, The more we dig into it, that people, anytime you go into surgery, they have to have that blood available in case you need it. It, does, it doesn't matter how minor the surgery is, whether you're having your tonsils out or you're having an appendix removed, they've got to make sure they cross-match you and have a unit of blood available just in case something goes wrong. Probably another benefit. Is it true that I have no idea what my blood type is? If I When I come in, well, can they tell me that? They can tell you that right then and there, but you can find out within 24 to 48 hours. And so most of our donors have their own live stream account, and you can go into your account and you can look it up and it'll tell you your blood type. See, another benefit of uh, just making a short 45 minute to hour trip to the local blood bank. Yes, yes. And you get your blood type, again, the mini physical. Make sure you bring picture ID, very important, particularly for first time donors, but uh, everybody should have picture ID so we can verify who you are. So I, I recommend you do this. Um, I'm going to have to get off my you know what and do it myself. Yes, now that I told you that being a, a, a type 1 well, diabetic is not I th deferral. I think you, years ago they, they were wary of it. Uh, I think uh, in the past, but uh, uh, probably in the last 20 years, we haven't had that issue. So I'll be looking for your name and, on the donor rolls. And, and treatment for <laughs> my type of diabetes, is the, 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 it's incredible how much better it is nowadays. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's really wonderful. Well, Dr. Rick Axelrod, thank you so much for coming in from Lifestream Blood Bank, President, CEO, and Medical Director. And once again, uh, we encourage you uh, to uh, get off the couch and get to the local blood bank or maybe um, a place where they're at because you show up in shopping centers. And the best way to do that is that lstream.org website. That's correct. Dr. Rick Axelrod, thank you so much. For more information, go to Livestream on Locations and set up an appointment to give the gift of life. And it truly is. I mean, this is incredible. What an opportunity for us. Go to www.lstream.org. Dr. Axelrod, thank you so much for joining us today on our Spotlight on Business. And thank you for helping us spread that message of the need for blood. And I can only hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you.